Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the National Library of Australia. My name is Murray Louise Ayres, and I'm the Director General of the Library. As we begin, I'd like to acknowledge Australia's First Nations peoples, the first Australians, as the traditional owners and custodians of this land on which we are privileged to do our work, and give my respects to their elders, past and present, and through them to all Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Thank you for attending this event, either in person or online, which is coming to you from Noonawal and Ngambri country. And may I just say, we'd love to have a conversation like this in the more intimate atmosphere of our very beautiful conference room on the fourth floor, which many of you will know. Um, you probably also know that our roof was destroyed in the hailstorm in January 2020. We've been without our fourth floor since then and will be for another year. So we have to have intimate conversations in quite large arenas at the moment. Um, so thank you for um, attending the event, which is celebrating National Science Week 2022. The Library and AI, this event, is the first event in a series co-presented by the Library and the ANU School of Cybernetics. During this um, series of cybernetic thinking for a new world, we'll examine the connections between libraries, language and cybernetics. While some of you may see science and libraries as strange, a strange partnership, science and technology drive us forward and help us create new and exciting ways to engage with our collections. Libraries are often leaders in creating systems that allow people to explore collections. Uh, we create IT systems and platforms that are cutting edge, of which Trove is the obvious example. So cybernetics first found form in the 1940s and 50s as a response to the rapid expansions in computing technology following World War II, fusing maths, engineering and philosophy with biology, psychology, anthropology and many other fields. From its inception, cybernetics was a, a generative intellectual wellspring, shaping everything from AI to critical systems theory, computer-driven art and music, design thinking and of course the internet. And tonight we'll discuss applying cybernetic thinking to the libraries of the future. In doing so, we hope to better understand our present moment in its complexity, its complexity, think differently about it, ask critical questions, make meaningful change and shape the futures that we want to see. So with me this evening is Professor Alex Sabiraglu. Um, Alex is Deputy Director at ANU School of Cybernetics. After completing her PhD in Cultural Anthropology at Brown University in 2004, Alex commenced a diverse career at Intel Corporation. During her 15 years at Intel, Alex made significant contributions to the R&D and commercial development of technology across the Advanced Research, Digital Home and Internet of Things divisions and is listed as a co-inventor on 11 patents. I have to say my, my count there is zero, Alex. <laughs> in 2016, Alex was appointed Principal Engineer in Social Science with the Internet of Things division and was Intel's foremost domain expert and research practitioner around homes and home life. She has authored multiple publications, presented at academic, regional and industry conferences and is a member of the American Anthropological Association and the Ethnographic Praxis in Industry Community. She's interested in the role that social scientists play in exercising ethics, accountability and data rights in the deployment of commercial cyber-physical systems. So please join me in welcoming Alex. So, yeah. Okay, over to you to kick us off, Alex. So, Thank you so much. That was such a nice um, uh, introduction. Um, I wanted to start also by paying my respects to the traditional owners of the country in which we're meeting, the Ngunnawal and Nambri people, and to um, acknowledge the incredible role that they've played in passing down millennia of knowledge of this country um, and what a delight it is to be here and to be talking about knowledge systems um, with the National Library. Um, today we are going to talk about 
uh, a body of work that we did together last year um, that produced a report called um, Custodians and Midwives, the Library of the Future. And we liked it so much that we each brought, we our, each own, brought our own, copy. our own copies. <laughs> um, it is also available on the NLA website, mm -hmm. as well as the School of Cybernetics website. Um, would you like me to talk a little bit about how we, yeah, how we came so. to do this? Or about, perhaps we talk about how you came to do it from your perspective, and then I'm happy to talk about how we came to it from our perspective ah, too. So okay. why did you say yes when we came to you? Really? <laughs> <laughs> because you're the National Library That's and you're okay. amazing. Yeah. Um, because uh, we are very interested in thinking about cybernetic systems and cybernetic mm. futures, particularly at the national scale. Mm. And we understand that our um, mandate as a national university is to create change um, and to engage with national organizations. And the library um, in particular has long been a leader in the development of creative new systems, often using um, advanced technologies and the types of technologies that we now refer to as artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So the opportunity to talk with you um, about the work that you're doing and to think about what the opportunities are for the library as you consider new technologies to integrate into your collection systems was quite exciting. I feel like I'm lisping a little bit. Yeah, that's okay. It's okay? Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> well, I guess from our perspective, if I just kind of take you through what our thinking was um, and how it, because it changed a lot through the project, we have been using these technologies for many years. Um, of course, the optical character recognition that we apply to newspapers is an example of machine learning. And... We're working with a, a company, I've already turned mine off, I'm really glad I did. <laughs> um, we're working with a company to progressively increase the accuracy of our OCR, um, and our intent here is quite clear, to improve the accuracy of OCR so that when people search Trove, they get better results back. Um, I think the other thing that might be less obvious to our users is all the um, algorithms that we use or reuse or tinker with to get the best possible um, relevance ranking. Um, our collection is absolutely enormous, so trying to get useful research results back to a user through a search, uh, search box um, is quite a big task. Um, and our largest text-based collection, that's the Australian Web Archive, involved months of work on algorithm, algorithms to make sure that the best and most useful results um, turned up. So that's probably not so vi visible. Um, I guess when we started to think more about this, we were thinking about the scale of our collections. Huge. About 10 million physical items, 280 kilometres of shelving. Our digital collections are enormous. Um, so, you know, at the end of last year, our web archive is billions of files. And just to give you an indication, just our four bulk harvests of Australian government websites last year added six terabytes or 70 million files to our collection. So um, they're just beyond human beings to kind of deal with them. We're also really thinking about maximising access to our collection. So when I think about this from the frameworks we're thinking about, the first is the kind of OCR example, improving access to the collection for immediate or near-term benefit. That's one framework we can think about. A second is to think more broadly about things we can't currently do. Um, and I thought I'd just give you a couple of examples of things we've thought about here, and they're not nearly as exciting as what Alex and team have thought about. One that I've had in my mind for a long time relates to our 19th and early 20th century manuscripts. We know that our collection is full of hidden records and snippets of First Nations languages and descriptions of culture. And we have a lot of these. So we also know that handwriting recognition, which has been a holy grail for my entire career, is quite mature now. So, would it be possible to digitise more 19th and early 20th century collections, put those together with already digitised material, apply AI technologies that did something like this? Look at all the words in this text, 
find the words that don't look like English or other languages for which AI technologies exist tell us something about their characteristics. And maybe we'd be able to narrow in on resources that have got language material and then engage with communities. So that's mm. an example. The other is one that's actually a, a bit funnier. Um, we have a huge image collection and about a million images and probably hundreds of thousands of those don't have item level description. So we have many, many images of sheep in paddocks, right? So a human being looking at one of these might be able to say this is a large sheep in a big dry paddock or <laughs> you and lambs in springtime. But maybe image recognition could do other things. Maybe we'd be able to detect whether the sheep is a Corriedale or a Merino. Maybe we'd be able to automatically detect drought conditions. Maybe we could link up to images from the CSIRO to identify the trees in the background and give us an idea of the likely location. So you've got to kind of start with these ideas of what can't you do now. But the other thing that was in my mind is about, and I'm sorry to bring in the banal, is driving down the cost of making collections accessible. Um, so our collection is growing really, really rapidly. The existing collection is beyond our resourcing to use human beings to describe. Um, and if I think about the last 10 years, <clears throat> the Australian population has increased by 20%. Um, we've seen an explosion of digital content that we must collect and provide access to legally. Um, but we have one third, third fewer staff than we did 10 years ago, and that tends to really concentrate your mind on, on new ways of doing things. We've also experimented with these technologies, but as we did, I started to have a lot of worries. So I started from a deficit or a risk perspective. I was thinking, OK, if we use image recognition software and we start to apply facial recognition software, could we cause harm? unintentionally to individuals or communities, and we see this everywhere at the moment, that kind of thing. If we tried to drive down our costs by using machine transcription of oral histories, what if it doesn't get it quite right and we cause kind of serious offence? Um, I think as we've learned more about this work, We've also learned that using these available third-party technologies kind of poses a negative risk. That is, that the data sets on which these tools are developed are inevitably partial, leaving some groups out. And of course, no technology is neutral. And on Thursday, we have another fantastic Science Week talk mm -hmm. from School of Cybernetics PhD student Kathy Reid, who will be talking about the consequences when languages are left out of speech recognition tools. So I'd say I came to this from a position of worry, thinking, what if we do these things without understanding the consequences and we cause harm um, unintentionally? Um, and I knew that we needed to engage with the human parts of the work, and I knew we had the right people across the lake at the School of Cybernetics. Um, so that's kind of where I started from, but it is not where these wonderful people it is, took it. So I'll hand is, over to it you again. It is definitely not where we took it. <laughs> I would say that... Um, uh, you mentioned earlier that my training is in the social sciences, mm. and so, and even though I worked in the tech world for quite a while, um, I tend to think about um, understanding the world around us as a set of opportunities and a set of um, ways that people are in the world that suggest multiple futures. Mm. So I'm not um, necessarily a designer or a technologist who is trained to think about um, what is the problem, tell me what the problem is, and then I will um, address the problem and fix the problem. Um, instead, I tend to think a bit more um, uh, reflectively and generatively and uh, with less necessarily decisions about having one right answer. Mm -hmm. um, and what we propose to you in response to your um, request to think about what the future of technology is and what some of the opportunities and risks would, would be was to take a little bit of a step back because we were very keen to create something with you. And I'm being very careful to, to talk about this as a joint project. Because it was. <laughs> and a, and a mm. creating with rather than a, a research project from a university team that came in and talked with you. Really, it was in, in itself a cybernetic process of conversation and dialogue and figuring out where we needed to be. Um, to produce the types of insights that were going to be useful to you. But my point here is 
um, taking a step back and thinking about what are the overall models and structures that you have in place that would help you think about the possibilities for future technology capabilities. And when I say future ones, I mean both um, what's in the very near term and kind of what you already have in your <coughs> toolkit, including optical uh, character recognition, um, as well as capabilities that were a little bit further out, including various types of machine transcription. So what you talked about being taking um, images or video or audio or other media and translating it or transferring it into machine readable text that then can be acted upon um, through to things like machine actionable collections um, and um, ideas of uh, transparent AI. So more to agendas and um, aspirational goals through to the, the very beginnings of the types of capabilities you already had. And thinking about those as technology capabilities that would um, develop over time, rather than what are solutions that are on the market today and what might happen if we use this particular solution. Because then you have a report that lasts maybe six months, um, and this is designed to be something that you can use for many years to come. Mm. And I think um, that, that's the advantage of working with a fantastic partner like this who doesn't have to worry about the kind of risk or how many dollars you've got in the bank. It kind of lifts your, your thinking. Um, Alex, so I was thinking about, you know, you said you took a, a cybernetic and an anthropological approach. Mm -hmm. You had many conversations with many people in the library. <laughs> we did. At the beginning, along the way, and then I think importantly afterwards also we had an opportunity to reflect back. So how was that from your perspective? I mean, th those experiences of talking to quite a number of individuals in, in the organisation. Uh, it was fantastic and amazing, and there's a little joke that any time I interview someone, I come out of it saying they're my new favourite person. <laughs> um, so I had about 15 new favourite people. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that because it is always um, a privilege and a delight to talk to people that are so knowledgeable about an area and have them share that knowledge with me. Um, and increase my understanding. So yeah, we, I, we had conversations ongoing um, with you, of course, um, with uh, people in collections, in people in digital or your IT department, um, in people in reader services, in people in archives, um, and I'm engagement office. I'm trying to think of the other ones without I think taking it my notes, but I think, okay. I, got, I, think I got a, a quite a range <laughs> there. And these were um, conversations that we had really about uh, what collections is like and what you are doing with the library with your core mandate of, of collecting and um, organizing and making accessible resources of national significance um, to Australia. And also just about the, a little bit, both about high level processes as well as the day-to-day -day work that they're doing. Um, we also had the opportunity to make sure that the conversations that we had were reflecting, um, making sure that we got it right. So we sent transcripts back and things like that. And we had ongoing conversations that really changed what we were doing. And even as we did those conversations, we um, got a much richer understanding of all the different perspectives on collections at the library and all the different types of people um, that touch on the library. Um, but really what we were inspired by at the very beginning was some of the early works in cybernetics, um, which has always had an interest in the libraries. So if you look back at the work in the 1967 um, archivists at the Library of Congress doing work and calling on librarians to start thinking about the automation of indexing, the automation of collections, and um, arguing that cybernetics should be part of that, through to the, um, Heinz von Forrester, who was a um, famous American uh, scientist. He gave a talk at the University of Wisconsin's Library Institute, which is now the I School, in which he has this quote, which I promise I will never read anything <laughs> off the screen. But what is so delightful about this is that it gives us an opportunity to think about the library as a system and as a cybernetic system, and one in which uh, there are two roles that it plays in the fabric of society. So it's not something off to the side, but it is central to what it means to be part of a community. And the idea that the library is a place of uh, where you can acquire knowledge. And that acquisition of knowledge is both as 
libraries as custodians of collections um, and also as places that kind of give birth or mm -hmm. they, they don't give birth themselves, excuse <coughs> me. They are midwives to the creation of new knowledge by um, the audiences that come and interact with the library. So we were really interested in what were the processes behind that and what type of an organization is a library and how we might use that conception of the library as a cybernetic system to help you think about what the um, processes are around new AI capabilities. And I think that idea of, you've mentioned the word process quite a few times. Yes, and, I probably um, did. And I think it's important because, um, uh, you, you know, these, un these days we understand so many more phenomena, whether they're natural or otherwise, as processes rather mm. than kind of finite things. But also because libraries are full of processes. Some of them are, are novel and many of them are repeatable yeah. and and um, and just get repeated over and over and over again and you kind of try to improve them. Uh, and I suppose the work that we're doing here is almost kind of putting those two things together, really thinking about repeatable processes but also novel ways of, of thinking about it to to, to get to a, a better understanding of what might be might be possible. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So we just to build on what you mm. were saying. Um, we are really keen on understanding um, libraries in general, and particularly the National Library, as a cybernetic system. So the library and the collections in the library are not a thing. Um, they are a set of dynamic processes. They are a set of dynamic relationships between um, ecological or kind of natural systems, between human systems, and between technology systems. And understanding the interplay of the um, resources and the people and the processes and the infrastructure and the data that go into making the library what it is, is the approach that we took. And in particular, what you were saying about um, the, the library being full of, of processes, I would say the library is, is full of components that together make a system, and that system is dynamic. And by what I mean by that is that it's never the same thing twice, right? right. Just like your collection is never the same thing twice, right. and every time, you use those numbers, I get, I get like a, a chill about like the, the kilometers of content and how many new, um, new pieces of content are coming into the library per year. I get actually a little bit of a hot flash because um, it's, it's really quite exciting. But it's, it's, it's like Heraclitus River. You're never stepping into the same thing twice. Yeah. Yeah. And so understanding how things change over time um, is, is quite important how we think about stuff. And the, the connection between the library as a system and concepts of time is quite interesting because um, in your collections um, strategy for 2021, you talk about collecting now what will be important in the future, which is a really difficult thing to figure out, I would think. And when we had conversations with the people that work at the library, um, it became very clear that you are sitting in a present moment that is always and already about the past and say 40, 50 years in the past and the decisions that were made then about what to collect and how to label it, et cetera, and where does it go and how will you be able to find it again. And also your future, um, your future <coughs> users and what they will want to be doing in 40 or 50 years. And so one way of going about to understand that is to consider the library as a cybernetic system. And what we ended up um, doing when we did an analysis of the library was thinking about five components of the library as a system. Um, there's the data, which can include lots of, all it. The, lots of it, <laughs> lots of it, but the data that's in the collection itself and then data about the collection and about your users and about your employees, etc. cetera. Um, there are the various processes that go into collections. There are the um, agendas or the context around which the library is situated. Um, there is the infrastructure, which is everything from the digital infrastructure and all of those platforms, as well as the physical infrastructure of the building and the, the, the kind of physicality of how you um, take care of, of collections. And then there are agents or people, right? So who is actually doing this work, um, both in the library and in various roles? And together, these things um, form the system of the library. And we were particularly interested in understanding the dynamics um, in the library. So what sets of opposing forces um, generate 
the work in the library. So we came up with five of them, um, including this tension that you might feel between quality and quantity, um, which I think you've talked about already. <laughs> um, thinking about the library both as a place in itself, as, an, as, a, as a node, and as part of a network of multiple libraries around the world. Um, thinking about the relationship between indexing and being able to organize information into smaller and smaller folders, basically, to get the thing that you want, and serendipity, and the idea of being able to make associative connections among the material, um, and uh, a few others, including um, are your, um, who is an agent and who is an audience, and that your audiences, um, so the users of the library may actually be changing um, with the, the development of things like machine actionable collections, and what happens when you're um, users are also some of your creators. And so we used um, these types of five parts of the system to ask questions about what data is evolved in a particular, um, in collections and what processes, et cetera, and to ask a series of questions between data and infrastructure and what are the dynamics between data and infrastructure or agents and agendas, et cetera. Um, and, uh, what came out of that um, is, oops, is, we'll leave it there for a second. Yes. <laughs> um, what came out of that is really an analysis of four categories of AI capabilities that we talked about, um, optical character recognition, machine actionable collections, um, machine transcription and responsible or transparent, excuse me, um, artificial intelligence and um, an analysis that helped you understand some of the opportunities um, with these technologies, with these solutions, some of the um, risks. So those would be things that um, in the use case that you thought you would use the technology for <laughs> might be a unintended or might be a bad consequence. Um, pitfalls, which would be the same thing, but if you ended up using the technology in a new way. So for example, um, what you were saying about facial recognition, that when you um, originally um, collected the collected the um, the items, there may not have been the types of technology available to be able to um, to do the types of search that you can do now, and of course issues, which would be kind of known known problems with the implementation of the technology, and we chose to think at the lab level of tech capabilities rather than particular solutions, so that you could reuse this process over and over. And one of the things that we did um, in workshops with the National Library and at the school was to start to take these capabilities and play them out over time. So to think about, well, this is what um, machine transcription looks like now. What could it look like in 20 years? And we were very um, careful to start using signals um, from uh, what is available in the market today and what we know is happening um, in research labs around the world to spin out what those scenarios would look like. And one of them that we did, um, and this one was for optical character recognition, um, is uh, the one about um, the second prime minister, the avatar of the second prime minister of Australia. Mm. Um, which I, I've shared with a high court judge with a special interest <laughs> in Deacon, much to his kind of delight. Um, and I guess if we think about this, this is one example, and this mm -hmm. is the wonderful work of Charlotte Bradley. A, yes, it is, um, one of our PhD, PhD students. PhD students. Um, but that approach of... Um, so you've, you've talked us through kind of systems, mm -hmm. um, You've also talked about time, and I might digress about time for a moment because you're absolutely right about that sense that we're in this present moment, but the great privilege of working in a place like this and my great privilege leading the organisation for a chunk of time is that you know that um, the collections we have have been carefully developed and stewarded by generations before you, um, and they're going to last longer than, than you will, much, much longer than you will. But the other thing is, um, uh, over time, um, the meanings in already existing collections change even when technologies uh, aren't changing because researchers always have different questions. Um, I've 
been involved in our kind of research activities here for 20 years and I continue to be incredibly surprised at the new uses to which collections that I thought I knew really well could be could be put. So, um, you know, research questions, whether it's academic research questions or the community, the same material generates completely different meanings for individuals and also over time. So that's just the time digression. But we're sort of talking about time and we've talked about systems mm -hmm. and the cybernetic star will be really helpful for us us to think about, as we're thinking about opportunities, kind of testing it against those things. But moving into a speculative fiction approach mm -hmm. for how to convey this, where did that come from? Just so, raw talent inside the school? Uh, partly. Mm -hmm. um, Charlotte Bradley, who was um, primarily responsible for running the workshops and writing up these scenarios um, in collaboration with the yeah. National Library and with other researchers at the school, um, actually has a background in drama and theatre. Yeah. Um, so partially that's where this talent comes from, but she is also an excellent researcher, um, able to pull together the threads that we are hearing from reading um, documentation from the library, reading the larger literature, doing the interviews and the conversations that we had with the library. And this is really a research method that's called speculative futures. So it's less about speculative fiction per se, um, or you can think of science fiction as showing us um, possibilities of the world in the future that we then may turn into science fact. Um, we find the arts and creativity a really useful way for, um, for highlighting and uncovering some of the values that uh, we may not realize that we have when we are thinking about the future. So we can produce these or produce these with partners and then kind of analyze them back. And in this case, um, the story is around a, an uh, avatar of Deacon that has been built in part from materials from the library. And it raises a series of questions about um, how reliable um, is this avatar? Can it be called upon in court? Um, should the prime minister um, potentially be uh, talking to this avatar to get uh, its, and it's really not an it, right, which is kind of the fun yeah. of it, um, take on um, policy moving forward? And I think it would be fair to say that this approach, um, the speculative future, Oh, look, it just went straight home to me. Uh, and that's actually something around this work too that I was reflecting on today, that um, the, the library itself is full of people with um, training in and deep adherence to a whole variety of disciplines from different fields. And we also have, within our community, we have great systems thinkers, mm. we have really great process thinkers, um, uh, where you know thinking from the systems perspective is really useful, and then we've got people like me, straight up and down humanities person, interested in the narrative arc. So having a narrative approach to this really, really appealed, I think, or at least for me, and I think for quite a few of our colleagues, it got us immediately into what are we talking about here? Yeah. So as a, in fact, if I think about the kind of book as a, as a system as well, um, it works on different levels for, um, for people who's kind of disciplinary or thought background Rounds are different, and that's a real strength as well, something I didn't expect yeah. to get. Mm. We're, we are very particular about starting each of the sections on the um, AI capabilities with the story, mm -hmm. right? And then being able to um, kind of peel back the layers of how we actually got to something this far out um, using what we understood about the opportunities and risks and pitfalls and issues around current instantiations of that, of that capability and where it was going in the future. So it's not just a fun story or a funny story. Mm -hmm. um, they're very carefully crafted towards particular ends to generate particular conversations um, and not just as an illustration of the research. So we provided you with um, kind of printout posters of them as well that we hope that you'll be able to use and using them with you in um, workshops as well. Um, and there are four of these scenarios in the report. I encourage you to look online and see them. They are all 
Um, even as I said, they're not kind of supposed to be just fun. Mm. They are um, delightful to read as well as mm. um, and serious really, analysis. Really, really thought provoking. So, yeah. um, so Alex, you've you've kind of talked about we'll be able to use these in in kind of workshops and mm -hmm. things and. Um, and that leads me to, um, you know, while we're on it, um, thinking about, um, you know, where to from here with this piece of piece of work. Um, uh, we collectively, you know, as soon as we we saw this piece of work, we knew about it. We knew that it needed a bigger audience because it generates such important conversations. Um, COVID kind of made that quite difficult last year, but we're back on track now. Um, so we've already, um, uh, of course, done a, a, a run of these. And in fact, your colleague, Professor Genevieve Bill, came and spoke to our council members in May. And I can tell you there's no other way that we could have kind of gotten them to understand what we're talking about than the storytelling approach. Um, we have, with your permission, shared it with another national library that's really interested. Um, we've got um, School of Cybernetics folks coming to talk to the CEOs of National Estate Libraries Australasia next March and to do workshops with staff. We'll start to kind of get it out a little bit more to conferences, etc. Because I think it's a piece of work that needs a broader audience. And then for us inside the library, um, we're about to embark on our next big piece of long-term strategic thinking, uh, and this will be one of the foundation pieces. Um, the, the CSIRO's you know, recent report on you know, the megatrends report will be another. Yep. Um, so, for, so for us, having a report like this doesn't sit on the shelf. I mean, it could sit on the shelf, and we've got lots of shelves that it could go <laughs> on to. Um, it's, it's to communicate, it's to help us, and I think to help and you to advance um, our special part of the kind of leadership of conversations like this in this country and beyond. Um, and then for us, at some point, of course, um, we have to make decisions here about where we're going to put our investment. Mm. Um, you know, where are we going to... Um, where do we think we might get the best returns for an immediate audience, uh, mid-term audience, or very long, and you can't really predict those things, you just have to make decisions. How do we balance out our desire to do a lot more about this with our need just to keep our existing large digital services just running, let alone improving them? So at some point for us, this will come down to investment decisions, um, but I feel really confident that having done this work with the school, that we will be coming to it with a much better framework around um, who might benefit, you know, and then when you're thinking from that perspective and you're thinking how they might benefit, you can think which technologies should we apply first mm. to which collections, for which purposes and for, for which intended beneficiaries. And while there's this really long-term thing, if we think about how can we make things better for short-term or medium-term audiences, we're probably, if we're careful, more or less on the right track for the long term. That's what I hope, because I won't be around to see this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so how do you kind of see work like this? Um, you don't have to run a big library, but you've been in a big corporation yes. where things have turned from ideas and concepts into making those decisions and, you know, generating a, a kind of a product. So, you know, just interested in your reflections on, on that, about when, when the rubber hits the road, yeah. um, what, what does it... What does it mean when you've already done this kind of thinking? Um, I think it's critical I've done this type of thinking um, at the very beginning of any um, any business strategy that you have, right? Mm -hmm. And part of what you're doing, and I I don't know if I'm allowed to say this to talk about your business strategy. Yeah, you're allowed to. You're allowed yeah. to. You have a business strategy, right? Mm -hmm. um, you have a finite set of resources, and you're making decisions about how best to to, mm -hmm. to meet um, to meet your goals. Um, when you don't do the work kind of earlier on to understand uh, what are the core concepts that are driving um, your decision making and how you're making those decisions and why, you end up with um, uh, very short term, um, 
you can end up with really great short-term profits, but no longevity. So understanding at a very general level, not just uh, what is the problem and how you fix it, um, but thinking generally, generatively from the beginning about what is the opportunity and what is the type of world that I want to create. And so from being generative rather than defensive, um, that's what I believe that this approach will do for you. And it is certainly um, the types of things that uh, I was trying to do with various success um, in various product groups at Intel. Mm -hmm. And when you do get it right and you do present a way of thinking about what you're doing can often look very, very simple or can look very like, well, we knew that already. And my, um, my kind of measure if I had gotten uh, my stakeholders to really understand something was to tell them like, oh, I knew that already, you didn't really, you didn't really do much. And I'm not <laughs> accusing you of saying that we didn't really do much, but the idea that, that really um, substantive change in your thinking can be um, very basic and very powerful. It doesn't need to be in the weeds about the latest technology that's at work right now, but a broader approach to thinking about change. That you would use that word um, substantive, and it just um, that was resonating with a. Uh, I guess I was thinking about the the alternative approach, the alternate approach to mm -hmm. taking this kind of approach. And over the last ten years, um, libraries around the world, and in fact in this country, have developed you know kind of labs um, or experimental kind of groups of people who are testing out these technologies. Um, to my knowledge, there has never been a piece of work that's been done like this. So right back. And you write that um, in all cases um, things have been learnt but often they're very, very short-term gains. Mm. Um, you know, the lab disappears in a few years and actually nothing further happens. So, and that's probably, I suppose, like a product that might look like really bright and shiny for a while, but it, it doesn't have a have longevity. So. Or it's the product that was 10 years too soon mm. and then it comes back. So I think about... Um, PDAs yep. um, and the Newtons and things like that of the world, and then coming back 10, 15 years later as when as, the time is as right. the smartphone. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Right? So we come back to time again. There's so we come a, back to time yeah, and like, yeah. what is the right timing, and how mm. do you make sure that it's not just the thing that you're looking at, but the set of relationships between the resources that you have and the people that you have and the infrastructure that's already in place that will make a particular solution um, stick or not stick in a moment in time. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, from our perspective, it's been a great piece of, of work. Um, it's been uh, really, it was really exciting. Um, and, you know, as I said earlier, moving from my, um, I won't say I was a narrow risk you know, but it's my job to think what could go wrong here, you know. <laughs> um, moving from that to a much more expansive um, approach and moving um, to an approach that really, you know, talked to a lot of people in the library who, as you say, have really deep knowledge of their, their, their kind of specificity of what they do, I think you mentioned at one, one point. Um, it was also, I think, such a great opportunity for science, social sciences and humanities to meet in one place. Um, and again, because we've got all of these kind of disciplines of ways and thinking existing in our workforce, I think it, we got a really kind of rich result from that. Um, I will say that when I saw the report, I just was delighted. I just... Um, it just spoke to me straight away and I knew immediately how important it was and the kinds of things that might come uh, you know, from it, uh, from it uh, later on. Um, I was particularly impressed by the case studies um, uh, that Charlotte Bradley did, but that's because I'm a kind of humanities tech story person, right? So that's what's going to talk to me. Um, so I think, um, you know, it was work created by two very committed teams and with a really professional crew from the ANU, I think actually those post-project interviews that we did and got a couple of people in the audience, they were really fantastic for us to reflect back on the process as well. And we often, here at the library, you're so busy running from one project to another, you don't often get that chance to reflect. So I think that was really, really fantastic um, as well. So um, look, if the 
Works excited you, the full report is on the ANU website and on, on ours, but I think we'll say that you will take these print copies from our hands through our dead cold hands because True. we want to hold on to them. <laughs> it's really worth doing so. But I think if you're really excited by this kind of work and you know somebody who would be, I think you yes. have got just the thing for them, I haven't do you, have Alex? Just, I do yeah. have just the thing for them. Um, I wanted to mention that our applications are open for 2023 Masters of Applied Cybernetics. This is a one-year course um, in cybernetics and applications are open for Friday until Friday the 9th of September. Um, we are very interested in people that come from very um, diverse places in terms of the knowledge that they hold and the practices that they have. So you do not have to have a background in any particular discipline um, or practice area um, to apply. We have everyone from, I see a couple of my PhD students in the audience, um, architect and economist, um, as uh, well as we have computer sciences, engineers, dramaturgs, as I mentioned earlier with, with Charlotte, um, chemists, um, IT people, uh, people that have backgrounds um, in professional writing. Um, and uh, it is a opportunity to learn how to think in a cybernetic fashion. And we are very interested in, um, as I said, diverse backgrounds. If you don't already have um, an undergraduate degree, that might be okay as long as you have really um, detailed and um, long professional experience. Uh, we are more interested in creative thinkers and critical thinkers than necessarily um, what your undergrad degree was in or was not in. So um, we are an open and uh, exciting group of people and we hope that if you're interested, uh, please check out our website. And I think that speaks perfectly to, um, I guess, our experience of, you know, we set out, of course, to look at how a national library like ours might integrate tools and processes enabled by artificial um, intelligence, machine learning technology capabilities, you know, integrating those into our core work processes to bring further to life our enabling um, uh, legislation, our mandate, which is to collect, to, to preserve and to make accessible um, library materials. And um, uh, you, I think you've seen from, I guess, the journey that we had from um, our little experiments, my risk-based thinking, to how this process has opened up our thinking. I think you can see the kind of journey somebody might take on if they were to do the master's program. Um, now, we do have some time for questions um, this evening. Um, now, the um, presentation's being live-streamed, and although we might be able to hear your questions without a microphone, those at home can't. So, um, if you have a question, and don't be shy, even though it's a big, um, it's a big arena, um, please put up your hand and we will bring a mic to you. So, and we'll see how we go with answering any of your questions. So, okay, who's going to be the brave person putting their hand up first? Okay, I can guarantee that this person will always ask a question at any public forum. Okay. <laughs> I feel like you might know this person. I do know this person okay. quite well. Okay. <laughs> um, thanks very much. Yes, I, I'm the reserve question asker. Um, I, I wanted to ask you to explore a little bit more about the, um, the pairings, the uh, you know, quality, quantity and so yep. on, because I'm interested in how that's used analytically. Mm -hmm. um, and my mind went immediately to scenario planning uh, sort of uh, modes which use similar sort of um, uh, opposite uh, mapped on a matrix mm -hmm. over time and what might happen to a system changing over time. So I was just wanting you to explore that a bit more. Certainly. Um, I talked about um, general dynamics that characterize the library as a system and I, there were five of them, so kind of quality, versus uh, quantity, agents versus audience, so what kind of roles are played um, among people that are associated with the library, 
um, nodes and networks, that the library is kind of a center in itself, but also part of a larger system. Um, formats and fluidity, that, a, that a, an object in the um, collection may start off as analog and switch to digital, or start off digital and then take an analog, or f switch multiple times over the course of its life. Um, and then serendipity and indexing. And our point here is, isn't rather that things may go into a, um, a scenario planning uh, matrix where one side takes over more than the other, but that what is um, useful or what characterizes the library as a system is the ongoing tensions between um, those, those two forces. And that if you got rid of those tensions and if you just went too much towards quality and not enough towards quantity or too much towards um, what the library needs to do as part of a global network versus its um, uh, mandate to the, to the Australian people, um, it, it kind of falls apart. Um, so we use it analytically as one lens to think about um, when we look at a particular technology capability and what the effects of introducing that capability into uh, the system of the library as kind of the, 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 the foundational things that you have to keep in mind that are not necessarily going to change that much, um, but that you need to account for. Um, whereas some of the dynamics or some of the things that come up with a particular technology capability may be specific to that. I think also, Alex, is that, um, you know, also in that kind of sense of tensions, I suppose, is um, what, the, what the drivers are mm. for, um, for making decisions. Um, uh, and, you know, the, you've talked about, you know, audience, well, you know, a driver for us is always going to be to improve access. At the moment, it's primarily for, um, you know, those used in discovery systems, machine actionable collections, it's kind of a different group. Mm -hmm. But when my CIO said to me a year ago, OK, in this space, smart ways, are you most interested, are you putting higher priority on improving access for end users or driving down the cost of processing collections? I actually said the latter mm. um, because that's a driver at the moment. But you can also see that if, even if that's a major driver, you're going to, you inevitably are going to have, um, you know, things balancing out. So I think, yeah. I think at any point in time, an institution's drivers for why they might do this and how they might do this are also going to change. There'll be some tension and it's not either or. Yeah. But you know, the, he needed an answer and I had to give him one. <laughs> so, uh, and it's it's a big issue with a collection this big and reducing resources, it's obviously an issue for us, yeah. So, other questions? Yes, we've got a question here, thank you. Sorry, I'm pointing at, at you, just so we can get the, the mic to you, great. <clears throat> I'm just wondering, um, so you developed this big system, how would you um, ensure that it would actually mesh with uh, the other systems that may be developing elsewhere in the world? Okay, well, I'd say first, I think we're not talking about developing a system here, we're thinking about the library and its work as a system that you can think of in that way. Um, but your second um, second part of your question is really important and it comes back to that thing that librarians really care about too, which is standards. <laughs> um, so to try and make sure that you're not doing things that can't interact elsewhere. Um, I would say at the moment the technologies that we are using right now um, and that we're likely to use, they're all produced by third parties. They're, they're readily available. You don't build an OCR, you know, there already is one. You wouldn't build your own handwriting, you know, you'd always reuse a tool that is there. And um, certainly in the library world, nationally and internationally, there's a lot of... Um, a lot of work that goes on in spaces like this from, you know, it used to be about descriptive standards 
now we put a lot of um, effort into preservation standards for the uh, for the um, for the web, for example. So I think it's always keeping plugged in to national and international movements, but a lot of it is around not building when you can use something that's already available, but also being aware of what, you know, no tool, no piece of software, no algorithm that anybody produces is neutral. So you'd need to be aware of what the kind of shortfalls are there. So um, so I think that's important. And we don't have to do it all, of our, all by ourselves either. Um, you know, an example here is for years and years, libraries have been talking about linked data, about putting out our metadata in ways that machines just on the open web can easily use. Look, we haven't had to do that as an institution because we contribute all of our metadata to OCLC, a big international organisation that pulls together 60,000 catalogues from around the world, and they've done that work on linked data. So I think it's choosing where you put your effort and not, not trying to do everything at once, too. I hope that helps answer your question. Yeah. It, I, I just wanted to add, too, that I'm always, um, always impressed with um, the work that is done at the National Library of Australia mm. and that you are world-leading, particularly with the OCR and the Trove mm. and the influence that um, that, that, that um, solution, that system, it's not really a solution, it's a set of systems, mm. right, in itself, um, has for making, um, for for preserving and making content um, accessible. Mm. And, it is and truly like, extraordinary mm. compared to, to other places in the world where I've y lived. Yes, who, who like to copy what we do and we gladly say go ahead <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to make exactly. it better for users uh, everywhere. So, um, uh, you know, we do need to invest more because, yes, we were world leading 10 years ago, but unless you can keep investing, you're not going to be there, and that's our, another mm. challenge for us too. So, um, Some other questions? Yes, we've got one up the back here. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, this is a question, I think, probably to Alex, but probably mm -hmm. it reflects my ignorance. But um, if I understand cybernetics, it's a, a, um, a sort of control system which deals with changes in in, the, in what occurs within the environment that it's interacting with at the system, is it? But what's been um, fascinating for me through my um, boomer lifetime is to watch how AI has changed the way that we as humans look at what's around us so that I've been limited by my five senses and, and, and a limited intellect. But then you apply neural networks and stuff like that and they come up with a completely different way of looking at things and connections which are absolutely fascinating. The question's in reverse. Are we the right people to be asking the question where the future is or should we be using AI techniques and neural networks to ask these questions rather than um, asking the individuals who work in the institutions? That is a great question. Um, I would say that my view of cybernetics is less about control theory um, and more about thinking about how to, um, how to steer a system towards change but without ever having the idea that you would ever have complete control, right? And that the types of systems that we're interested in are open systems and adaptive systems, so you're never really going to, to see the whole thing or control the whole thing. Um, the question that you have about um, uh, what types of agents are capable of, of, of commenting on potential futures and where we may go with them, I think you're right that there are things that we can um, take from large-scale data sets that are um, interpreted through various um, neural networks and things like that, but that is not, that is always partial in the same way that our knowledge is partial. It's not that we humans like don't know enough and we just give it to the machines, the machines will have absolute knowledge and be correct, um, but that there are multiple ways of addressing what the future might be and playing those off against one another um, is certainly a more useful way, I think, of determining where we may be headed than just uh, taking one viewpoint. So. Yeah, I, I think I'd also say I 
definitely don't think that it should just the people in this library who are thinking about this. That's why we want yeah. to kind of take it out on the road. Um, I also think if libraries, archives, museums, galleries are not thinking about these things, if we cede the field um, to solely to commercial interest. There'd be something yep. really, really missing there too. Um, we don't have a profit motive. We have a public good motive. Um, and we also enjoy a lot of trust from the um, from the community. And, you know, looking recently, of course, about some of the large um, tech companies sort of lost quite a lot of trust because they weren't transparent mm. about what they were doing. That's very much in my mind. Trust is really important for us. So taking our community sort of on the journey with us to say how are we using these technologies what are the you know what might be the results what are we thinking about in the future is a big part of it so um, as is working nationally um, with other institutions like ours and internationally we're going to be part of it but if we if we're not there there'll be something really missing from the picture so um, I think we have time maybe for one more question, if there's another question from the floor. Okay, well, we actually have run slightly over time, so I was just watching that. Okay. Um, so only two minutes, but that's okay. Um, so, and of course, you're very welcome to come and have a chat with us afterwards. We'll probably put our masks back on for that. Um, so uh, would you please first uh, join me in thanking um, Alex for a really interesting discussion. So thank you, Alex. Thank you. Um, encouraging you to think about the Masters. And I'll also just again give you a reminder that the second event in our cybernetic thinking for a New World series will be 6 o'clock here, Thursday. Um, and we hope you can join us as Alex, Alex's colleague, Cathy Reid, examines that speech recognition technology that we're all using in our everyday lives through a cybernetic um, lens. So the details for that on our, on our website, but I hope you'll either come along or watch it from home as well. So thanks very much for coming along. And again, thanks very much. It was such an exciting piece of work. And yeah, you're not getting the beautiful print copies out of our hands. So <laughs> thank you. Okay, thanks, thank you. Alex.